five. If they seriously think that sacking Swella Braverman is going to be a boost for their polling chances, <laughs> absolutely out of their minds. Four. The real problem the British economy faces is a lack of business investment for the private sector. Three. He is in government. He wasn't even elected. He wasn't the first choice. And it does seem that Rishi Sunak is listening to sort of centrist newspaper columnists rather than to people who actually understand what's going on on the doorstep. One. We have lift off. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. This was not the outcome we wanted, but we've spent the last few months planning for all eventualities and remain completely committed to stopping the boats. So said Rishi Sunak on Wednesday, soon after the UK's Supreme Court unanimously ruled the government's policy of deporting asylum seekers to Rwanda was unlawful. Lord Robert Reid, Supreme Court President, said asylum seekers sent to Rwanda would be at real risk of being repatriated to their countries of origin without proper consideration of their claims. A defiant Rishi Sunak then vowed to change the law and do whatever it takes to stop small boats illegally (laughs) crossing the channel, telling MPs he was prepared to revisit domestic legal frameworks and international relationships if they continue to frustrate plans to deport illegal migrants. We shall see. This latest blow for the Prime Minister comes soon after the rather spectacular departure of Home Secretary Swella Braverman. In an incendiary departing letter, Braverman, whose views offend many metropolitan commentators but are popular with millions of ordinary voters, accused Sunak of betraying his promise to stop the small boat crossings and said the Prime Minister manifestly and repeatedly failed to deliver on key policies with Sunak seemingly determined not to upset polite opinion. Ouch. Braverman also wrote of what she called Sunak's failure to rise to the challenge posed by the increasingly vicious anti-Semitism and extremism displayed on our streets since Hamas's terrorist atrocities of the 7th of October. This is something that you saw firsthand last weekend, Alison, when you stood in Parliament Square on Remembrance Saturday. There you were in front of Churchill's statue, talking to countless members of the public who stopped to say hello. So what did you see last Saturday, Alison? in the shadow of Churchill, the Cenotaph and the Houses of Parliament? And how did the various protests make you feel? Well, Halligan, actually, I was going to launch into a Suella thing, but I shall keep it in check. Um, (laughs) There's time. (laughs) What I saw at Winston Churchill's statue was the faces of many absolutely wonderful Planet Normal listeners. And, you know, this is going to sound a bit cheesy, but I just feel so happy when I am among... Planet Normal listeners. I was holding one half of the banner for British Friends of Israel and many listeners and Telegraph readers came up. Oh, I can't name everybody, but Gracie and her lovely boyfriend, who may or may not be Charlie, they just graduated from Durham. They are trying to spread the word about Planet Normal to younger people. What do you mean may or may not be Charlie? Did she tell you she was about to bid him or something? <laughs> no, she did Don't say that. They seemed, <laughs> they seemed like a really lovely couple. He's but Charlie. I just, he I... may or may not be my boyfriend by the time you broadcast. I <laughs> God, no, women they... can be tough on us poor men, can't they? They looked exceptionally well matched. They looked like... <laughs> A couple out of a fairy story. They were absolutely beautiful. And there was Belinda and her husband. And believe it or not, Liam, there was Paul, the father of baby Noah, Planet Normal's youngest listener. So Paul had left Noah with mum for the day and come. And there was, you know, Peters and Richards and Tims. And it was lovely, really. And I think that something that I wrote about for The Telegraph on Sunday, actually, was that I thought that there had been a lot of misreporting of the day, because if you believed a lot of media reports, you'd think that far-right yobs had invaded the Cenotaph and ruined Armistice Day, and that was actually not true at all. I was about 300 yards away, and there was a bit of scuffling and a few beer cans after the two-minute silence, but otherwise, it was a very, very respectful and dignified occasion. And this brings us a little bit into one of our big topics today, Liam Suella Braverman, who had warned, had she not, in an article in the Times the previous week about the Metropolitan Police and double standards in the policing and playing favourites, as Suella described it. And that was certainly my observation. I saw police officers 
kettling the white working class lads on the approach to Westminster Bridge. I thought they were behaving, police were behaving in quite a provocative manner. Although, look, I'm not naive. I'm not saying they were all angels and some of them were certainly out to cause trouble. But I really noticed the difference between the approach to the football, so-called football crowd and the yobs. And they wouldn't have tried those strong arm tactics, Liam, with the pro-Palestine marchers. They simply wouldn't have dared to risk the backlash. So we saw this myth being written at the English Defence League and football hooligans had caused all the trouble on Armistice Saturday while the hundreds of thousands of people bussed in by the coach load from Bradford, Batley, Dewsbury had passed off peacefully. Now, we do have one advantage of mobile phones with cameras is that members of the public can now gather evidence which contradicts the police story. And we now have proof, video proof of numerous incidents which capture very, very threatening behaviour from some of the pro-Palestine protesters, including a a poppy-wearing couple in tears at Victoria Station, where Michael Gove was pursued by a mob. One young woman, listeners will probably have seen this, shouting death to all Jews. It was unreal, really. And there was finally a very disgraceful episode in Trafalgar Square, where there were lots of thugs, actually. Let's call them far-left thugs, Liam, because the other lot get called far-right thugs. Far-left pro-Palestine thugs assaulting people in Trafalgar Square while the riot police stood by and watched. And when this video was posted, the Metropolitan Police said, having reviewed this footage, it's clear the reaction of the officers was not what we would hope to see. We are making further inquiries to understand what happened. Well, let me suggest, co-pilot, we know what happened. As Suella Braverman had warned, the Metropolitan Police were playing favourites. And by allowing that vast march to go ahead on such a provocative and sensitive day, they were effectively guaranteeing that there would be inflammatory scenes on the streets, as indeed there were. So I think Suella Braverman was not the cause of the violence, as some have suggested. She was the person who predicted what would happen if we continue to allow these very unsettling, clearly anti-Semitic marches to go on. I wonder what you think, Alison, about the extent to which sacking effectively Suella Braveman has damaged Rishi Sunak. I've been struck by the real contrast between so many commentators saying, oh, thank God he's got rid of Suella Braveman. Rishi Sunak's sensibly tacking back towards the centre ground. (laughs) This has got to increase his chances of the next election. And yet I look at the comments underneath your column. I look at the Planet Normal Mm. inbox. I talk to ordinary people in my small market town in North Essex And a lot of people are angry that she's gone. A lot of people think that this very outspoken, courageous Asian Brit actually speaks for them because she's somebody who has called out this small boats policy, who has said that if the UK needs to leave the European Convention on Human Rights, then it should indeed do so. These aren't opinions that sit well with many, if you like, bien pensant commentators. These aren't polite opinions that are heard at high table in various Oxbridge colleges, but they are opinions that are heard in pubs and clubs up and down the UK, and particularly in the Red Wall. Do you think Sunak's now abandoned the Red Wall? He's going for the sort of Lib Dem swing voters in the shires rather than trying to build on the new Tory coalition that Boris Johnson created in 2019 when much of working class Britain, if you like, much of the Red Wall did vote Tory. Sunak seems to have abandoned that, no? Oh, yes. I think they've completely written off the Red Wall. I mean, I've, you know, I've been a bit of a day since writing my, I had to write my Suella resignation letter piece very, very fast. I haven't really been picking up all the reaction, Liam, but I can't. I mean, we know, we know the commentariat, uh, such as it is, can often be wildly adrift from the feelings of the United Kingdom. But if they seriously think that sacking Swella Braverman is going to be a boost for their polling chances, <laughs> absolutely, 
out of their minds. It is death knell time now, absolute death knell time. So the latest Servation poll, and this is before the controversial cabinet reshuffle, we'll talk about that in a minute, bringing back David Cameron. So this is an incredible poll, just one poll, obviously, Labour 49%, Conservatives 19%, Reformers jumped over the Lib Dems to 11% and the Lib Dems Mm. are there on 9%. Now, I would be very confident in predicting that reform will now, after the sacking of Suella, will pop up another few points, another couple of points. So they are within touching distance of the Conservatives. Now, I wrote about the letter, Suella's letter, which we'll have the link to that in the show notes. One of the most devastating verdicts ever pronounced on a Prime Minister by a sacked member of his cabinet. Now, lots of people will say she's ambitious, she's bitter. No one's used the word hormonal yet, Halligan, but it will be coming because it's a woman. It's a strong woman. So they're all going to get at her for that. And hell has no fury. Like a woman used as leverage to get Sunak into number 10, who then sees all the promises he made her ignored. And I think, I mean, it's a very long letter. It's absolutely devastating in every particular because clearly she had an agreement with him to carry out conservative policies, you know, such as reducing legal and illegal migration, going for a proper Brexit, stopping the gender nonsense in schools and so on. And what happened is that Rishi Sunak had no interest, really, really no interest in in delivering any of these policies and she was becoming more and more frustrated. For a year as Home Secretary, I've sent numerous letters to you on the key subjects contained in our agreement, made requests to discuss them. This was met with equivocation, disregard and a lack of interest. You have manifestly and repeatedly failed to deliver on every single one of those key policies. Now, I love this bit. Either your distinctive style of government means you are incapable of doing so, or, as I must surely conclude, you never had any intention of keeping your promises. I mean, wowza, Halligan. I mean, she is, you know, never mind a hand grenade. She's gone in with, with the, the Uzi. The with the Uzi. <laughs> She's gone in with the, with the Uzi. And I think that, obviously... This She's bazookaed a- him. <laughs> Him. <laughs> Let me just drop this in, Halligan. I heard this week from an insider that 25,000 Conservative Party members have cancelled their subscriptions in the last few weeks. Okay, so there weren't that many left. I think there are about 150,000 left. So they are hemorrhaging now and parties like Reform and the SDP are piling on new subscriptions. It and, just goes and, to show, doesn't it, a sort of flashy background in asset management and the Mm. city and all that and you come into politics and you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed if you don't actually understand how ordinary people think you're toast I mean whatever you say about Boris he kind of understood how ordinary people think Blair he absolutely understood how ordinary people think or at least he surrounded himself with people who did David Cameron sort of did, but he had Andy Coulson, of course, before he went to jail, (laughs) who understands how ordinary people think. And yet Sunak has surrounded himself with sort of endless nice boys in loafers and nice girls with low ponytails who don't really understand ordinary British people and their instincts. And that's why he keeps making massive mistakes. Think about his conference speech. Oh, we're going to have a new international Mm. baccalaureate and we're going to stop people yeah. smoking. Yeah. And we're going to have a cones hotline. You know what I mean? Crikey. <laughs> I don't think he said that. That, that last was a bit jo- was a lie. I was just sort of <laughs> it was a nod to in, the, in the thick of it. It might have well have been a cones hotline. But tell me, what did you think of this letter? Because it's practically written in fire, isn't it? You need a fire extinguisher when you're reading it. What do you think of it, what she says? The advice always is if you've got a really important email or letter to write, you write it and then you sleep on it and then you send it in the morning, right? Yeah. Crikey, I wonder what the midnight version was like <laughs> if, if this was the sort of 8.30 in the morning version. Um, no, she can write, clearly, and she's very, very angry. And I remember I interviewed Swella Braveman not so long ago, yes. and she was already freelancing a bit. She was already saying things that I know Downing Street didn't want her to say. And now she's really unpacked her feelings because she feels that Rishi Sunak has let her down and let her party down and let the country down, particularly on this small boats 
issue and on facing down anti-Semitism. Yes. And what we've got here, I, I really detest the idea that a lot of the commentary have that all Asian people have got to think the same way. Oh, they mm. should all be left wing. Of course they yeah. should be. You know, it's like saying all Irish people should think the same way. It's just insane. It's, it's an insidious form of racism in itself. What you've got here, right? What you've got here is a lower middle class girl from the suburbs. who She comes from near you, doesn't yeah, she? Who, who, I know exactly where she grew up. And I grew up with many families, many Asian families like hers. She lived in a suburb called Kenton. And it's right next to Kingsbury, where I where I grew up. And her childhood home is literally about half a mile from my childhood home. She's slightly younger than me. I didn't know her when we were younger, but I know the school she went to, and I know mm. many people in common who she knew as a kid. And look, she is from a lower middle class family of strivers. Her parents did not go to university until they were adults, and she got a place at Cambridge, and then she went and did the New York bar as well. She is a real striver. Sunak is cut from different cloth. He's from a much wealthier background. And I think it shows he's a lot smoother. He's a lot more appealing to a lot of the commentariat. But actually, the Tory grassroots, the sort of grammar school boys and girls, the visceral strivers, the just about managing, the alarm clock classes, whatever you want to call them, different elections, we have different terms for these really important centre, centre right voters who determine elections. If it's Basildon man or or, or Worcester yeah. woman or whatever it is, Mondeo man in, in the past, she, I think, really understands those ordinary people, be they brown, black, wherever they're from. She's got a lot more in common with lower middle class white Brits than she has, I would say, with ritzy ditzy, well healed, you know, Asian non-doms. <laughs> I think that's all absolutely spot on. I was absolutely furious reading this letter because I've been thinking in a sort of, you know, still quite trusting way of the government. I mean, you know, how ridiculous am I? That really all these things. No, honestly, I mean, I'm just a simple Welsh girl, don't understand the machinations. But I thought, oh, lots of this stuff is being obstructed by the Home Office, by civil servants. Surely the central core of government must be working to stop this illegal migration, which, let's face it, Liam, at a time when the Middle East is in conflagration, it's very dangerous now to be allowing single men from the Middle East and North Africa in large numbers into our country. 600 came ashore on Sunday. All right. This is, this is really not acceptable, not just because we have our public services are under stress, but because there are real implications for national security. And I think this is driving Suella. And what we've seen, I mean, we're recording now on Wednesday where we've had, haven't we, the Supreme Court saying that the Rwanda plan cannot go ahead. And in this letter, when she is basically saying she had warned Sunak that it was clear from day one, if you didn't wish to leave the ECHR, that's the European Convention on Human Rights, the way to securely deliver that Rwanda plan would be to block off the ECHR and this Human Rights Act, which Tony Blair's government brought in, which has really inhibited our ability to deal with illegal migrants. So she was saying that the deal that Suella Braverman struck with Rishi Sunak in October 2022, when she agreed to become his Home Secretary, and that got him over the line into number 10. So they had this agreement. And basically, she then says, in the most damning way, that she has consistently argued that they had to have a plan B if the Supreme Court ruling on Rwanda went against them. And she says, you have failed to prepare any sort of credible plan B. I set out what a credible plan B would entail. And then she said, I can only surmise that this is because you have no appetite for doing what is necessary and therefore no real intention of fulfilling your pledge to the British people. And this it, is It makes why you wonder I, if anyone's ever spoken to Rishi Sunak like this. Doesn't I mean how do you think he reacted? But I got an email from a very senior female Tory party donor, and the subject was incandescent. Yeah. Incandescent. These people, he is in government. He wasn't even elected. He wasn't the first choice by any means. Liz Truss was the first choice. He's not elected. He doesn't have a mandate. The only mandate he has is to deliver 
on the 2019 Conservative Party manifesto. And it's quite clear from Suella Braverman's letter that he has no intention of doing that. And I think he should go because he is probably going to kill off the Conservative Party. And he let's just tell me about this reshuffle where he's brought David Cameron back in. And basically, the four great offices of state are now occupied once again by privately educated males. I, I said in the column, I don't have anything against privately educated males because I live with a very nice example of that breed. But nevertheless, Liam, it's all cosy chaps, isn't it? It is, yeah, three, three of them. James Cleverley's not privately educated, mm. but certainly he seems to have brought in people that are really going to wind up the right of his party. I mean, David Cameron, who obviously campaigned against Brexit, there's no real prominent Brexiteers knocking around at the moment. I guess the most senior Brexiteer left in government, though James Cleverley did nominally vote to leave the European Union. But the most senior Brexiteer is Kemi Badenoch, I guess, who's still Business yeah. Secretary and, and, and Trade Secretary. I agree with you. It, it does seem an odd way to go about things. And it does seem that Rishi Sunak is listening to sort of centrist newspaper columnists rather than mm, to people yeah. who actually yeah. understand what's going on on the doorstep. In the way I think we do, given the Planet Normal inbox, given the comments under our newspaper articles, given where we live, and the kind of people we are in the background that we come from. I do wonder what's going to happen now. Look, there's been some good news on the economy. Inflation's fallen to 4.6% in October from 6.7% in September. That's still quite high by international standards. Inflation in the Eurozone is below 3%. In the US, it's just above 3%. We're 4.6%. But if inflation does come down now, if we don't have more interest rate rises, if they can get growth going a bit and we've avoided recession so far, then it may be, it may be that the Tories can stage some kind of recovery, particularly if an election is the back end of 2024. And particularly if the really vociferous, for now, finger on their lips, left wing campaign group on Starmer's backbenches, if they start getting gobby and complacent and start speaking out, that's going to scare a lot of sort of middle England voters. So it seems remote now, but there's at least some glimmer of an electoral turnaround, some scenario. But I don't see any chance at all of that scenario, given what Sunak's just done. He will have alienated so many core Conservative voters. And, you know, we've mentioned them briefly. Mm. The fact that reform is now out polling the Liberal Democrats is astonishing. And Richard Tice, who's the leader of reform, Obviously, Nigel Farage is the chair of reform. Nigel's gone into the jungle. Gone into the jungle, as, as, yeah. As, as we know. Richard Tice sent a kind of jokey tweet out saying, thank you to Rishi Sunak for being the best recruiting sergeant for reform. <laughs> Tice claims that they've had hundreds of people joining up in the last 24, 48 mm. hours because there's so much disconsternation that the Tories have got rid of Braverman, who really is their kind of standard bearer of centre-right traditional Tory policies. So this is really interesting now. I think Sunak has made a huge schoolboy error, which belies not his lack of intelligence, because he's clearly got a lot of intelligence, but it shows his lack of experience and his lack of political nous. I don't agree with you, co-pilot. I, I think the undertakers are carrying the coffin. I cannot see from my mailbag any sign that the, so let's look at the figures. The figures are really interesting. So, of the 2019 Conservative voters, only one in 10 has moved to Starmer. And as we've seen from the recent by elections, what's happening is my lot, my lovely lot, they are not voting Conservative. Now, th there has been some idea that number 10 hoping that the sheep would return to the fold for the general election. I have never bought that. And what I am seeing this week for the first time mm. is readers saying, actually, do you know what? Not only we are we not going to vote for them, we're looking at reform, we're looking at the SDP, we've yeah. given up, Suella's yeah. gone, she's gone, she's the person who is looking out for the British people, for British borders, British interests, they've got rid of her, we can't stand any of these people. Just to finish, Liam, mm. of all the people he could sack, Jeremy Hunt, hello? 
someone so wildly unpopular. But no, he has to sack the woman who actually was speaking for Middle England. So I think we'll start uh, making the funeral sandwiches, Halligan. Oh, to be Sir Graham Brady. Do you think he's getting any letters? <laughs> Could it happen? Could there be another change of leadership before the election? Oh, crikey. My nerves. My nervens. My nervens. My nervens. I, I'd, re- I'd really like to see it. In March, the Daily Telegraph broke a story. The former health secretary, Matt Hancock, has described the leaking of thousands of his WhatsApp messages. The Daily Telegraph says it's obtained thousands of WhatsApp messages. On the 100,000 leaked WhatsApp messages revealed. Oh, some poor so-and-sos had to go through those. And now, those same poor so-and-sos are going deeper. The stunning incompetence of the British state was absolutely extraordinary. The COVID inquiry may be underway. They definitely knew what they were doing when they took them out of the hospitals into the care homes. But you shouldn't have to wait years for answers. You've got lockdown. There is no way that that isn't going to have a massive impact. If I had sit on that material to protect politicians' dark secrets, I don't think that would have been an honourable thing to do. The Lockdown Files podcast from The Telegraph. Follow now, wherever you're listening to this, to make sure you don't miss an episode. Established in 1938, the National Institute of Economic and Social Research is Britain's oldest and most prestigious independent economic research body. Receiving no core funding from government or anyone else, The National Institute lives on its wits, raising money for specific research projects, which then funds more general work. The current director of the National Institute is Professor Jadget Chadder OBE, a Yorkshire-born, London-raised British Sikh, an expert in macroeconomics and central banking. Professor Chadder holds or has held prestigious posts at universities including Kent, Gresham College, St Andrews and Cambridge. Known for his analytical acumen, and his inquiring, independent mind, Professor Chad is one of the UK's leading and most respected economists. Ahead of next Wednesday's autumn statement, I invited him aboard the rocket and started by asking him to outline his general view of the UK economy. We're certainly a position we'd rather not be in. We've had, as you well know, very little economic growth since the financial crisis. Um, Of course, we've been hit by some very large shocks. The uncertainty of how we were going to leave the European Union. At least the short and long run impacts of those have not materially helped the economy in the long run, we don't know. Covid, of course, is something we felt very keenly across the economy and that's led to some scarring in terms of the opportunities available to young people have been affected by that. And with the large increase in energy and food prices following Putin's invasion of Ukraine, there's been a what's called a cost of living crisis, but a huge spike in inflation which has also materially affected the sort of livelihoods or sense of well-being of people, particularly at the bottom end of the income distribution. It just hasn't been a very good period uh, in British economic history. And looking ahead, our own analysis suggests that there'll be very little growth over the next few years, You know, possibly half a percent this year, half a percent next year. But in terms of income per head, when you divide that by the number of people in the country, it's as near zero as as damn it, really. There's not any material improvement in average over the past few years or looking forward over the next few years. It strikes strikes me, Professor Chadder, that the UK economy, indeed most of the world economy, hasn't really got out of second gear since the collapse of Lehman Brothers in 2008, since that global financial crisis. I think the UK has grown on average since 2010, once we were sort of clear of the crisis, by 1.2% a year. That's a very low level of trend growth. And then on top of that, we had uncertainty relating to Brexit, as you say. But the evidence seems to show the British economy has fared pretty much the same as France and Germany, or better than Germany since then. But then we had COVID, didn't we? I mean, how do you think historians are going to look at this period since the global financial crisis until now? When they look back, will it be seen as some kind of lost, stagnant decade and more? To me, it looks like the doldrums in the sense in which the advanced economies, having benefited from the kick of globalisation that you and I lived through in the 1990s, that had accompanying it 
very rapid rates of growth for the newly industrialised economies. As China opened up, as India opened up, as the post-communist world adopted market economics. Absolutely, you were in the middle of all of that at the time. And of course, the East Asian, what was described as the miracle, these economies as well, adopting very high level manufacturing practices that projected their incomes forward very rapidly. That all led to a global rate of growth that was 5 6%, and we got used to that over time. So one factor we need to remember since the financial crisis is that a lot of these economies have, by and large, caught up. So they're now going to sort of grow at the frontier, which is, say, 3 to 4% or 2 to 3%, a much lower number than the numbers they've had in the past. And when you add to the fact that they're a larger share of global growth, that simply arithmetically reduces the rate of global growth. But within all of that, what we see is the UK has has also had a, a large fall in its economic prospects, pretty much time it to the middle of the first decade of the 21st century associated with the financial crisis. The financial crisis was something that arguably hit the UK harder than it did other advanced economies. We are very highly invested in the financial sector. A lot of our high value service sectors also rely on financial markets, whether it's actuarial or insurance or accountancy or legal. And all of that, I think, has further acted to slow down the rate of growth of the UK economy. And there haven't been the linkages that we were told there would be. We were sort of told 30 odd years ago, if if London and the South East grow fast, they'll be trickle down to the rest of the country. But I'm afraid that the level of technical term, it's capital stock, infrastructure, education, whether it's vocational or otherwise, hasn't meant that those other parts of the countries have been able to exploit the advantages that a rapidly growing London and City of London has given it. So in some sense, that divide, sort of two-speed economy, seems to have re-emerged in the last few years. And of course, on average, that's of course uh, leading to a lower rate of growth than we otherwise might have anticipated. Would you say now, we're recording this before the inflation number comes out on, on Wednesday, but I think we can all see it's going to come down quite sharply. Have we now got our arms around inflation? Is this the beginning of the end of the cost of living crisis, do you think, Professor Chadder? Yeah, there are two points to this. The inflation rate, even if it is around 5% later this week, which we anticipate it being, is not consistent with price stability. You know, the rate of increase in prices at 5% is still extraordinary by recent economic history. We really do need to see inflation come down to around 2% so that, materially speaking, inflation doesn't enter into people's day-to-day calculations. And we still think that's going to take another year or so for it to come down. What the Bank of England have rightly done is increase interest rates to levels of around 5% with the five and a quarter. It seemed to me to be appropriate to bring inflation back down to that level, but at a speed that's not too rapid. It won't create large pools of unemployment and it won't depress aggregate demand too much. So we're in the right kind of space, but we need a little bit of patience to get back down to 2%. But there is a sting in the tail of this story. Just because inflation has come down, it doesn't mean that the prices of goods that are traded in international markets will fall. Inflation is really that process why those, by which those prices have been jacked up to a higher level. And if permanent, it means that goods that we buy that are priced in international terms, food, energy, will remain high even if inflation comes back down to 2%. And then that becomes a particular problem for those people who earn in sterling and have to spend in items that are essentially priced in dollars. It's all very well for people who work in industries where their wages are linked to international prices very closely. Those aforementioned high-value sectors, the financial sector, IT, pharmaceuticals, high-level accountancy, legal services and others. But for the vast majority of people whose income are based on activities that they do solely in the UK, those elevated levels of food and energy prices will continue to bear down on their disposable income for some years to come. Why is it, Professor Chadder, that inflation's been so much higher for longer in the UK? Our peak was 11 percent plus. America peaked at around 9%. The US is down now at sort of 3%. The Eurozone around 4%. We're still up near 7% at the time of recording. What is it about the UK that's led to that outlier inflation status, much higher than comparable countries? First, we're not a net producer of oil and food. We import oil and food. And because these things are priced in dollar terms, 
it means that when sterling depreciated at various points in the past, that's added further pressure to inflation in this country. Compared to the euro area, we're a more open economy. So we're more prone to these kinds of things affecting our inflation than in the euro area, which is overall, when we look at it, more closed, relatively speaking, than the UK. So I think there are two things going on here. There's been this large global shock. We're more susceptible to it because we're a small open economy. And it must be said that when these shocks came along, the stance of monetary and fiscal policy was rather loose. We'd had a huge fiscal injection that was continuing into the tail end of the COVID period. And interest rates, when the, the shocks came along, were, were very low by historic standards. And that, I think, has added a further kick to the inflation process. Had we got hold of it a little bit earlier and with a bit more commitment and strength, that might have taken some of the edge off the inflation so it didn't reach the double digits that you were just talking about. Let's just drill down into that. Why did the Bank of England keep saying inflation would be transitory throughout 2021. The signs in financial markets were clear. Inflation's turned out to be the opposite of transitory. It's turned out to be persistent, stubborn, and much higher than expected. Why did the Bank of England make those mistakes, Jajit? Well, it wasn't only the bank. There were, these are the similar comments coming out of central banks, advanced central banks around the world in the euro area and the US. I think we have to remember just what a desperate situation we were in during the COVID period. Towards the end of it, yes, we'd found a vaccine. We didn't know how it was going to work. We also had new, huge numbers of people in furlough. And so central banks you know, had the choice collectively to, to look at the emerging inflation in 21 and stamp down it, on it immediately by raising interest rates very rapidly to the levels that we now see even more quickly than they have done so. But the question is, at that time, and the UK deaths from COVID are pretty much near to a quarter of a million people. It wasn't entirely clear that we were out of the shadow of COVID. And there was a sense in just trying to make sure that it was behind us before normalising interest rates. And I think that was a process that most central banks went through to sort of make sure that it was out of the system before increasing interest rates. But of course, the UK being an open economy with various restrictions on its supply side, I have to say that the supply side of the economy at least in the short run, has been affected by the process of Brexit, the uncertainty that was attached around to it, as well as we can now see all kinds of firms having deferred or delayed investment in the UK economy till we worked out how we were going to Brexit. That has all made the supply side less responsive than it would otherwise be. So in response to the shocks, what you get is a much larger increase in the price level and a higher inflation in the short run. So I think, again, there's, there's a kind of sense of, you know, let's be kinder to people after the COVID period. And then as a result of being a bit kinder, what we ended up with was a higher inflation because of structural issues embedded in the UK economy. What would you change about our monetary framework, if you like, the way the Bank of England operates, maybe the makeup of the committee? Because something needs to change. Inflation was at a 30-year high before Putin's ghastly invasion of Ukraine. So we can't just blame our inflation on Ukraine. And yet the UK inflation went compared to a 2% target, we were up above 11%. So clearly something does need to change. What should it be? Well, I think there are a number of things we need to learn from this experience, this inflation spike. And that is really being open and robust in our analysis as to what is going on. I think we have a pretty good idea of why inflation was higher. And a lot of these things we knew at the time. And we could have done more, I think, to explain what we thought was going on and asked to be challenged about it. Now, that is something that at their meetings, the Monetary Policy Committee do do internally. But again, I think more external interaction would certainly have helped absorb the kind of things that we've been talking about a little bit earlier than was the case. And I think that's an important part of what the bank has to think about, how it interacts with people and forces external and internal challenge. I think you know, that is the most important thing. I don't think we're saying anything now that you and I were not talking about in 21. And the question is, why was that not finding its way back into the analysis or at least the explanation of the decisions made by the bank? Because it's entirely reasonable for the bank to say, look, we saw all of this, but we didn't want to raise interest rates too quickly and create a large amount of unemployment because the country had just been through this huge existential crisis. I think under the regime that we've got, 
which is in fact a flexible inflation targeting regime. And what we mean by that is we don't expect inflation to be at 2% all the time, particularly if there have been some very large shocks. But what we need to do is carefully explain how and when we will get back to target as a result of the policy stance we've taken. And to some extent, there was a lack of clarity about that decision, if indeed that's what the bank had in mind. Wasn't there also, Professor Chadder, a lack of sort of cognitive diversity on the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee? You know, I don't remember many members of the Monetary Policy Committee even questioning endless quantitative easing, for instance, over many years. And I don't know anyone on the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee who could be described as a monetarist, which is a very important school of economic thought, somebody that really focuses on money creation rather than just on more traditional aspects of macroeconomics? I think the thing that we have to get across in very difficult circumstances is exactly how we respond and change our monetary policy interventions as circumstances change. So if we go right back to March 2020, lockdown began. You know, I don't think you or I knew whether we were going to be alive in a year's time. We just didn't understand the scale of this. So we had a building up to some huge fiscal interventions, which were abnormal, extraordinary, and I would still say justified at the time. And the bank went out of his way to support those by lowering bank rate to 10 basis point and reigniting QE that ended up with it practically doubling. We did more QE in 18 months than we'd done in the previous decade. And no one questioned that at any time on the Monetary Policy Committee that I can see from the minutes. No, no. I think what I'm trying to say is that if we go back to March 2020, that sounds like the right thing. But as the situation unfolded, particularly after the clarity on the vaccines, we could see that we were coming out of the COVID cloud. And what we could have done at that time was reverse the emergency cut-in rates back to 50 basis points and not carried on with QE in the sense in which we could have said, look, we said we were going to increase it to this amount, but it looks like we're over the crisis. We're not going to do the large part of it. But I think to some extent, people were caught in a trap of saying, we've committed to do this, we have to continue to do it, because bond prices will reflect the fact we've committed to buy an extra slug of bonds. In fact, by not continuing QE in 2021, that would have helped bond prices fall a bit and would have further acted to tighten monetary conditions at the right time. The extent to which there was, again, I said earlier on, interaction and robust questioning of those decisions is something that I I find most problematic in all of this. We can look at the minutes, but we don't have information on all the discussions internally at the bank where the kind of views that you and I are putting around were almost certainly expressed and how they were absorbed and led to a set of decisions that looked like these things were not being considered. I'm pretty sure they were. But I also think that more external examination in real time and being prepared to do that might have helped lead to some different decisions. Internally as well, I do question whether we need to drive all the decision makers on the MPC to the same decision every time they meet. We might formally allow for more dissent than just a 25 basis point here or 25 basis point there decision. Could well be a case now for allowing individual members their own view on the path of interest rates as well as the stock of QE. And by allowing them that space, we might then have been better able to monitor the dissent or disagreement or dispute that was happening internally that looks like to us didn't happen, but I'm pretty sure did. Final question ahead of the autumn statement on the 22nd of November. Would it be irresponsible for the Chancellor to cut taxes? Your institute has said there's actually a fair amount of fiscal headroom, a lot more than the OBR has suggested. So would it be irresponsible for the Chancellor to give his backbenchers what they want in the form of a tax cut? I mean, where I'd like to see tax cuts is for investment, full expensing of business investment. The real problem the British economy faces is a lack of business investment for the private sector, a lack of a commitment from the state to build up infrastructure through public investment in a well-targeted and consistent manner, addressing the question of a tail-off in foreign direct investment, which we know is a little bit noisy as a series, but does seem to have fallen off in the last couple of years. And this investment that we need from the state, the private sector and overseas is the thing that will ultimately drive us to higher levels of output and productivity and increase income per head. So to the extent to which tax cuts can directly help that, they will certainly make 
a good impact because they'll help what we call the supply side of the economy and the demand side of the economy. But having tax cuts on income for the sake of it that might help inject more demand into an inflationary economy is problematic because we have enormous calls on the state at the moment. We could do better by increasing public sector productivity, but there are calls on the national health service, social care, as well, given recent events on defence, that makes it hard to think about having tax cuts when these things need to be funded, at least in the short run, by keeping taxes where they are until the supply side of the economy responds to the investment interventions that I've been talking about. To govern, as they say, is to choose. Professor Jadit Chadda, thanks so much for appearing on Planet Normal. An absolute pleasure, Liam. See you soon. Well, there you have it, Alison, Professor Jadit Chadda. He's softly spoken, but he walks with a big stick. Yeah. His words are weighed carefully in the Treasury, at the Bank of England. He has really carved out a position of independence at the National Institute. The National Institute now very much at the forefront of our national debate. It's not the Institute for Fiscal Studies, which is more about tax and spending. It's more about broader macroeconomics and central banking. And I th- hope that you felt my chat with him was insightful. Yeah, it certainly was, Liam. And I, I picked up a lot. And obviously, I'm highly trained now by one of Britain's leading economic commentators, if not the British economic commentator. So my ears pricked up when he was talking about the fact that the Bank of England, we've talked about why did they behave as they did during lockdown. But I was interested to hear him suggest that actually some kind of concern for the impact on the British people was guiding their policies after what had been a very bruising time. Now, of course, we could argue about the rights and wrongs of that. But do you think there was something in that? I do. Look, it's a lot easier for me to lay into the Bank of England than it is Professor Chadder. You know, this guy works with the Bank of England all the time. But I thought for somebody who's very much, you know, an in the tent establishment economist. He he is very independent minded. He's not scared to put his head above the parapet. I think that's exactly what a public intellectual should be and what the director of the National Institute should be. And it was interesting that he raised concerns about the Bank of England getting inflation wrong for mm. such a long period of time. I've known Jajit Chadha for many, many years and we talk a lot. He is easily one of the most insightful economists I know. He isn't scared to say what he thinks. So then when he does say things that are awkward for policymakers, then his words pack a powerful punch. And it strikes me we are now at an economic crossroads. The UK's avoided recession. Inflation's come down quite sharply, as I mentioned before we heard the interview. Next week, Planet Normal will be recording in the aftermath of Jeremy Hunt's autumn statement. And a lot of people, certainly on the Tory backbenches, are looking for tax cuts in that autumn statement. I don't think they're going to get them. If there are tax cuts, it will be cuts on business taxation rather than personal taxation. But it does strike me that given that we've been in this cost of living crisis, given that real wages have been falling, they've only started to rise now with average wage rises just going ahead of inflation uh, last month for the first time in quite a while. But people's economic well-being has been severely squeezed, particularly Mm. if you're a young family with a variable rate mortgage and so on. And the government finances are really, really squeezed. As we often say on Planet Normal, the government's spending over 10% of all tax revenue on debt service. So that's dead money, just paying the interest on money that the government has borrowed. It will be absolutely crucial, the economy, in the run-up to this election. It will be do you feel better off than you did when I was elected? That kind of Reagan style campaigning. And at the Mm. moment, the Tories can say we avoided recession. Germany didn't avoid recession. We've now got our arms around inflation and growth is coming around the corner. But it's really uninspiring. You know, there's still a sense that Mm. the economy is suffering the aftermath of lockdown, the aftermath even of the global financial crisis. Do you know, Alison, since the global financial crisis, this country has grown, GDP has grown on average since 2008 by just 1.2%, which is mm. extraordinarily low by historic standards. We generally grow by sort of 2 2.5%. And when the pie is so much smaller, politics becomes more combative, more sharp-elbowed, more nasty, because there's just less to go around. 
Well, Professor Chadder made that point, didn't he? Which I, was something I've been thinking about is that people just don't feel better off. No. I mean, they can say inflation's, you know, is, is, is dropping, but I don't think that people are feeling that in their supermarket shop yet. I'm not sure that the, that food prices are coming down. And I'd say that was along with energy. That's been one of the most punishing things. I did get a begging email, not a personal email, but a, an email to Tory supporters sort of saying, yippee, we've brought inflation down. We've kept one of our five pledges. How much credit can the government actually take for that, Liam? Not very much because tackling inflation is the Bank of England's job. They've done 14 interest rate rises. And it was pretty clear that barring some massive geopolitical squall, which could yet happen this winter, Mm. that inflation was going to come down. Look, it's worth saying that this lower inflation doesn't mean that prices are coming down. It means they're going up less quickly. And food price inflation in particular is still elevated. It was 12.1% in September. So a basket of food will have cost you 12.1% more in September than it did in September 2022. In October, that food price inflation went down to 10.1%. But get this, in the fine print of the Office of National Statistics press release on Wednesday, where the inflation numbers were contained, the ONS disclosed that food inflation was 10.1% in October compared to October 2022. But since October 2021, get hold of this, food Mm. prices have gone up by 33%. No, that's incredible. Absolutely huge. That's emerging market levels of inflation. Yeah, that's not advanced industrial economy levels of inflation. And of course, food price inflation is regressive. What does that mean? It hits the poor hardest because the poor, the vulnerable spend a much higher share of their income on food. So food price inflation is still elevated. Low inflation means that prices are going up more slowly, but they're still going up. I don't feel that there's going to be a big kind of feeling of relief that this cost of living crisis is over. I don't think, at least on current reckoning, the economy is going to rescue the Tories from their electoral woe. Now on to our listener emails. Your messages sent to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Keep them coming. We love to read your thoughts. And we learn so much from you, the citizens of Planet Normal. Well, invariably, Liam, we have got a lot of emails on the Suella and Rishi show. Anne says, I too am furious with this government. The only people I can find who support Suella's sacking are those who will never vote Conservative anyway. It seems to me that this government and indeed the bien pensant elite are more concerned with being nice or at least being seen to be nice rather than doing the right thing. Truly, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Suella is better off out of it. And I note that Nick Gibb, who's been very effective in driving up literacy rates at the education department, has also left getting out before this woeful ship sinks. And David says, Dear Alison and Liam, I think the latest reshuffle is an act of gross self-interest. Rishi's already decided that he's going to take a trouncing in the coming election. He's got a job lined up, no doubt, in the USA and wants to make a speedy exit. In a way, to protect his woke credentials, he's choosing a vanilla cabinet with vanilla policies to avoid potential banana skins. Leaving the ECHR will be a total non-starter now, not that it was ever really in play. Hopefully for Rishi, he will lose his own seat and will be able to walk away from politics without a whimper. If he does manage to hold on to his mega majority, he will resign his seat as early as he thinks fit. This would be a minor blemish on his already withered reputation. He just needs to navigate the next year without major incident. Good luck with that, says David. A successful leadership challenge would also suit. Kicked out by those nasty far-right nut jobs with conservative values. That's me, Halligan. Actually, I'm a right-wing... No, I'm a far-right yob. That's what I am. As for Suella... <laughs> In your little cotton socks. <laughs> In my little cotton socks. As for Suella, why would she not make a challenge now, says David? Why wait until post-election when she may well lose her seat, going by Alison's theory of there being no safe Tory seats? And her novelty value, someone else may become new flavour of the month. She could even force a hung parliament. What's the incentive for her to wait and face the prospect of five years in opposition? I just don't believe that Rishi has taken this route to help him win an election. And I would have to add idiot to my opinion of him as spineless if he does. 
Please help me to restore my sanity. I've been with Planet Normal from the start, still listening every week. Alison, I have great admiration for your campaigning against anti-Semitism, the lockdowns, and all of the other madness we are experiencing. Liam, your calm, considered approach, in particular regard to the economy, does give me hope that there is at least one adult in the room. Thank you, says David. Very nice email. Here's a here's a funny one, Liam, from Anthony. Rishi Sunak standing next to David Cameron looks like Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> did, <laughs> did no one think of the optics? Absolutely, it's true. And this is a nice one from Gareth, who's writing to us from the States, where lots of Planet Normal listeners live. Gareth says, last week I went to a veteran's breakfast at a school where teenagers ushered in their guests on arrival to the auditorium for an address. Two boys wearing their scout uniforms posted the flag while the choir sang the American National Anthem. The children then served the breakfast table, which had been decorated in red, white and blue. The school was in a small village in upstate New York. British people feel similarly about veterans, albeit with a tendency to express it in a far more reserved manner. But British public discourse has become dominated by a radical and loudmouth fringe to a point that anti-Semitic chants are tolerated within earshot of the quiet reflection of Armistice Day. Such radical voices also exist in Washington, D.C. and California, but do not carry to the American heartland, where simple common sense drives the thoughts of people as they reflect on why they are safe from the horrors unfolding in far-off lands. The rational mind cannot fathom why so much of the British establishment has become so imbued with a toxic ideology. This is from Kit. Dear Alison and Liam, I'm a long-time Planet Normal listener, writing to you as you're the only people worth writing to. Couldn't agree more, Kit. Mm. The recurrent reshuffle is a farce. The only reshuffle of value would have been the immediate removal of Rishi Zunak. (laughs) <laughs> an unelected leader of the party and an unelected prime minister doing irreparable damage to his party. Swella Braveman had her finger on the pulse and sacking her is another example of Sunak's gutless ineptitude, says Kit. Bringing David Cameron back is strange in the light of his part in the Greensill scandal, an easy target for critics. The awful, soulless Jeremy Hunt remains to stifle the economy of growth or improvement. Halligan, your country needs you. The yes. Inflation figures may fall, but that's not Hunt's achievement. I'm a lifelong conservative who believes in the basic principles of conservatism and would never vote for anyone else. Neither would I abstain as that sacrificing of freedom and privilege, hard won and protected. If only there were someone or party who believed in true conservatism. By the way, that's certainly not reform, says Kit. What's galling is that Sunak and the witless MPs who put him there have handed the next election to Starmer and the rabble. I don't know how this nightmare will end, but can't stop agonising about it. Please sing me a lullaby, as ever kit and this is from gordon briefly alison your column in the telegraph moved me to tears i feel you should know that you're expressing the views of so many of us living in what was once a great country the weakness displayed by our politicians and police are just the tip of the iceberg of a society that's lost its moral values and respect for those that died for us to save us from a vile regime once we give in to those that scream the loudest on the streets this can lead us down the slippery road to mob rule and history shown how dangerous that path is I admired your courage to go into London for Armistice Day, but please take care. You're too valuable a force, together with Liam, to have anything happen to stop you both carrying out your invaluable work and being the flagship of truth and reason for the past three and a half years. What a nice email from Gordon. Thank you. And so that's it from Planet Normal for another week as we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason views. Email of the week, it's Halligan's turn. It's got to go to David, hasn't it? It's it's his description of Sunak's self-serving reshuffle. So David, send us an email to planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. In the subject heading, put mug winner. Send us your home address and we will send you a Planet Normal mug. If you enjoy Planet Normal, please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. In the dark reaches of the night, Copilot sends me me our reviews to cheer us up at this dark and difficult time. (laughs) Alison, briefly, (laughs) cat update. Is the cat on its way? How much is it costing you? There's been a a cat setback. Oh! Oh! (laughs) I know. (laughs) So the tests that were necessary for the cat to come to England were posted by the uh, Turkish vet to the laboratory, but the samples were damaged in transit. 
Oh my god, so that's another 1500 quid or whatever it is. I may have to crowdfund it, guys. <laughs> Meow! On that bombshell as we speed away from our beloved planet normal and the madness of planet Earth comes back into view. Thanks as ever to our producers, Isabel Bouchard, Elliot Lampet, Cass Ho, and Louisa Wells, and thanks to Alison's cat. <laughs> Stay safe and in touch with us and with each other. Until next week, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. 